Good morning and welcome, family. We are so glad that you've joined with us this Sunday morning. I, I hope that you are comfortable wherever you are. Maybe you've got a, a nice cup of coffee. Maybe you're with your family. Uh, wherever you are, we're, we're happy to have you, and we're glad that you're here with us as we join together again in this online format. We are together on mission for God in the city of Locust Grove and McDonough, and we exist as the church, as God's people, to equip the family of God, you and I, one another, for the mission of God to see everyone around us transformed by the gospel of Jesus. One of the ways that, some of the ways that we're doing that this morning, we're going to be singing together and praying together, hearing God's word, and being sent out on that mission uh, by a benediction. We hope that you'll join with us. Join with us in singing. Join with us in prayer together. Join with us in hearing the teaching from God's word and applying it to our lives and, and listening, hearing, and obeying. And join with us in this mission that we're on, that we're on with one another as a family uh, in our communities. There's some things, some ways that we want to communicate with you this week uh, and, and some ways that you can stay connected to us through the week. The first is continue to engage with us in, on social media. We uh, really appreciate all of the, the feedback and the one anothering, the caring for one another, looking out for one another that we're seeing going on. Continue to do that. You can find us on Facebook, on Instagram and on YouTube, on a new YouTube channel. So make sure you check that out. If you haven't subscribed yet, click the subscribe button on the YouTube channel so you can stay up to date there as well. We will be posting updates and continuing to keep you updated through those means. And speaking of updates, we have a little one for you on our meeting schedule. We have been talking about how we would come back together physically. And we appreciate uh, everyone's prayers and and the, the discussions surrounding that and feedback. Uh, here's where we are, a family. If things continue uh, on the same trajectory in Georgia, we anticipate meeting again on Sunday, June 14th. That's the second Sunday in June. And so that's our hope. That's our plan. And you're going to see things begin to roll out to help us put those plans in place to meet in both Locust Grove and McDonough on June 14th. One of the things you'll see soon is a survey. We'd love some feedback from you just as we make those plans. We want to be able to serve you in the best way possible at both of these locations as we as we move forward. So be on the lookout for that and and just be encouraged that we are going to be meeting again, uh, Lord willing, uh, soon on June the 14th, and we'll have more information about what that looks like as it's clear and as uh, guidance has, is clear as we get closer to, to that date. Uh, one quick thing, we will continue to have some form of live streaming, even as we begin meeting, understanding that not everybody's going to be ready to meet at the same time. And we understand that. We understand every family is different. And we trust you to know what's best for your family. So we're excited for that. And we look forward to seeing all of you again sometime very soon, gathered together in the room, praising God uh, together as a church. Uh, secondly, if you would, continue to give. We appreciate the faithful giving of so many of you who have partnered with us here in uh, Locust Grove and in McDonough. Thank you for that. There are three easy ways you can give. You can give by mail, 170 Cleveland Street, Locust Grove, 30248. You can give online, southpoint.org forward slash give. And you can text any amount to 84321. Three easy ways to give. And we, we need and we are thankful for your faithfulness to give. And I just want to encourage you in that discipline, in that spiritual discipline of, of giving, uh, as, we're, as we work together as the church, the resources that you give as partners with us enable us to minister to those in our community, to one another, and to the needs of the body. And we thank you for your obedience in that. Uh, last, if you're new here, we are so thrilled that you would join us. Thank you for uh, clicking that link and, and joining with us as we sing and as we work together. Uh, you can go to southpoint.org forward slash connect. There's a little form there you could fill out. Tell us your name. Tell us a little bit about yourself. We would love to be able to connect with you during the week. Or you can just drop a comment on whatever uh, video feed you're watching, and we would love to follow up with you that way. Thank you so much 
for joining with us. It's an honor to have you here um, worshiping with us this Sunday morning. Church, would you hear this call to worship and sing together as we begin to worship our great God as a church? It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night.
the shadow your redeeming love I'm standing on the promise the promise of new life cause I am yours forever Jesus you are mine oh Jesus you are Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. You came along, put me back together.
join with me this morning in prayer? Father, we come before you this morning as your people. We confess our uh, great need for you. We confess our, our great need for redemption and salvation through your son, Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that you would uh, show us and teach us from your word as your people this morning. We need your spirit. We need your uh, wisdom. We need to understand your word and, and to live by it. Father, would you keep us from going our own ways and doing our own things, from uh, pursuing the idols of our hearts, but would you, would you call us this morning by your spirit uh, to yourself? Would you draw us close as your people? Would you knit our hearts together with one another while we're apart? Father, would you increase our faith and would you show us a greater vision of your son and of his work and of your love for us in Christ Jesus? Father, we pray as we, as we hear your word from Hebrews 13, that we would uh, listen. Would you unstop our ears and uh, that we might hear? Would you open our eyes that we might see? Would you be at work in us as your people? Father, in this, in this time, we pray that you would comfort those who are filled with fear. Father, as we uh, face uh, sickness as a society, we pray that, that you would uh, bring comfort to those who are sick. Father, that you would um, comfort those who are uh, fearful, uh, that we would find joy and peace and rest in the hope of Christ and in your kingdom and in your work and in your faithfulness to us as your people. Father, we, we praise you. We pray for your church globally. We pray for the Kellers in Prague. Father, would you, would you uh, be at work in that city by their labors? Would you uh, glorify your name? Would sinners be drawn to Christ Jesus and be reconciled with you that those who were once lost and walking in darkness would be made alive, would be saved, would join in with us and with all the church and praising you as we were as we were made to. Father, I pray for your church locally. I pray for all of the churches here in Georgia and in Henry County. Father, would you give wisdom and, and uh, grace as churches consider how to begin meeting? Father, would you strengthen your church as we're apart? Father, we pray specifically for uh, First United Methodist in Locust Grove. We pray that you would uh, be with them and as they meet, as they um, are online and, and working through the same things that we're working through as your people here at South Point. Would you uh, bless them and their time? Would you uh, give them, uh, would the gospel be evident in their lives? Would it be proclaimed and taught? to your glory. Father, we thank you that you are uh, our, our father. And we come to you this morning as your children, that you are our creator. And we come to you this morning acknowledging that all things are made by you and that you are in control of every part of our lives. And we trust our lives and our futures and our families to you. Father, thank you for the promises you've given us in your word. We pray that you would help us to hear it as Mark teaches us, and would your spirit accompany his words with great power and to your glory. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. There are a lot of things not to like about flying out of the Atlanta airport, from the parking to trying to go through the security lines and having to take off your shoes and take your computer out of its bag, to going down the long escalators, to getting on the concourse train. Think about the concourse train for a minute. There are a lot of people on the train, and the train takes off, and everybody's struggling to find a place of stability because everything around them is moving. 
and they're grabbing for the straps above, they're grabbing for the windows behind, they're running to the seat that's there because when the moving of the train starts and the moving of the train stops, if you have not secured yourself, you're going down. The book of Hebrews talks about a shaking, a time of instability that's coming. And Scripture tells us in Hebrews 12, when we looked at it last week, when this shaking comes, the things that are not clinging to Christ, that are not rooted in Christ, are going to crumble. Everybody's on the train that's taken off and stopping. Everybody is living in this kingdom where there is going to be a great shaking. But the only people that are going to be left when the shaking is over are going to be the people that find themselves in Christ and Christ alone. And we're going to look at that at the Scriptures this morning. And I want to read that text to you this morning. But I also want to tell you that from the text, what we're going to be seeing or trying to answer this question is this. What do we hang on to when the shaking starts? And we've seen what we hang on to theologically. We hang on to Christ. He is our access to God. He is our advocate before the Father. And when we trust Him and His death and His burial and His resurrection and we rest in His finished work, then we are stable and secure. But then practically beyond the theological, the practical things that we need to look at and how we live our lives on a day-to-day basis, what do we need to hang on to? Think about that as we look at the text this morning. Verse 27 of Hebrews 12 says, this phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, for those of us who are in this kingdom that cannot be shaken, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. But he goes on to give us these ethical instructions for those who are living in the kingdom. Look at verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Verse 5, keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? Here's here's the main thought I want you to take away from the text that we just read this morning. I'm going to give you three points, three practical points that we need to incorporate into our lives this morning. If we have entered the kingdom, we will embrace the ethics of the kingdom. I, I want to submit to you this morning that we are in a kingdom that's within a kingdom. We are in the kingdom of this world, but we are also in the kingdom of Christ. We are in the kingdom of our God. And in this kingdom that we are in, if we have entered this kingdom through the blood of Christ, through the sacrifice of Christ, if we have entered the kingdom, we will embrace the ethics of the kingdom. And so what are the ethics of the kingdom? What are the things that we need to anchor ourselves to in these shaking Times. And he gives us three things in Hebrews 13, 1 to 6. The first thing I want you to consider is this. If we are in the kingdom, love is unending. He gives us that in verses 1 to 3 of Hebrews 13. Love is unending. Love is unlimited. Love is unbending. In the midst of shaking and challenge and persecution and rejection, the text is telling us you must do all that you can to ensure that above all else, the supernatural love in this supernatural community must continue and be unbroken and unending. Love is unending. And he gives us three categories. Number one, we must love 
the saints. We must love the brothers. We must love the brothers and the sisters. And there is a strong revelation from God in 1 John chapter 3 that would seem to indicate that, that brothers and sisters, if you've got a problem with loving brothers and sisters in Christ, you might need to call into question whether or not you are a believer in Christ. He says in verse 16 of 1 John chapter 3, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. When he says brotherly love, he's not talking about uh, a sentimental love. He's talking about a, a sacrificial love. He's talking about a closeness to other human beings that the world knows nothing of. The word used here is Philadelphia. It's interesting that he uses this love philos at the beginning and uses the word for brother. So there is this brotherly love that is not somehow a lesser type of love or a less intense love, but it's loving brothers and sisters who are in Jesus Christ. Someone has said that brotherly love is a desire to climb into each other's souls. That's close. Some of us don't have a clue about closeness. Some of us come from broken families, dysfunctional families, where there's no such thing as closeness in those families. But we can go back to 1 John, and he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's in that light that we bring our sin to bear and expose our hearts and our souls and our interior world. Someone said it is a sweet inner authentication. In this kingdom, we are real family. And listen, in this kingdom, watch, we are real family, and real family isn't perfect. God, God help those Christians. God, God help those families. God help those churches where everything looks so good on the outside. Everything is so clean. Everything smells like it has been sanitized and purified. That's not life in the real world. And you'll never experience brotherly love in a fake context. But he's saying there is to be this love where we are real and we are climbing into each other's soul and we are family. And in family, we are not perfect and we know that. But in family, we are not shallow and we really love each other. And that is what we know, that we love each other, and that is what we are known for, brotherly love. And he says this brotherly love is, is unending, it's unbreakable. When there's brotherly love, I'm not going to get mad and run off. I'm not going to be uncommitted or distant. I'm not going to be self-centered or individualistic, brotherly love. It's a sweet, it's a sweet fellowship that finds meaning in and of its very existence. It's not that we do have to do anything, but that we are something. I think oftentimes of the family meal, uh, my 11th grandchild was born this week and all the kids will get together and we'll be sitting at the table and the kids will say, I'm done. And of course, being the oldest person in the room, I say, well, you may be done, but you're going to sit here and we're going to spend time together. We're just going to be together. We're going to learn from one another. We're going to fellowship together. You're not going to run off and be hypnotized by your iPad. We are going to be together because we are family, brotherly, brotherly love, loving the saints. Love is unending. I would challenge you today in a world where um, so many people find their ideas on the world's social media platforms and people who say they are Christians find themselves debating and find themselves arguing and the world looks in and says it doesn't sound like by the tone of their voices that these people really do love each other. I would challenge you to look at two guys who disagreed sharply and whose theological perspectives were on different uh, uh, poles, uh, a guy named George Whitfield and uh, John Wesley, and these brothers debated, but they loved each other, 
and they were kind to each other, and they were gracious to each other. And if you're engaged in a conversation on social media or if you're engaged with a brother or sister in Christ in a conversation, I would challenge you to make sure that people know that you're not driving just to be right. You say, does truth matter? Absolutely truth matters. But the arguments of truth don't have to be fought between believers on social media platforms. Issues of sin don't have to be worked out on social media platforms. That's why we have Matthew 18 that says there are ways that we work these things out. So he says, cling to brotherly love. Let brotherly love continue. And let the world look in and know that above all else, these people love Jesus and they love each other in sacrificial ways. So so love is unending. There is this love for the saints. Um, Secondly, there is this love for strangers. And while we've got this love for the saints, that's Philadelphia. We have this love for the strangers, that's Philozenia. And we understand uh, xenophobia, where there is this hatred for people or this dislike for people or this fear of strangers. And he's telling us that not only are we to love the brothers, but we're to love we're to love strangers. There's to be this love and this warmth and this care that is shown to strangers, and it's called hospitality. It's such an important thing that an elder in a church in 1 Timothy 3 2 should be one that is given. To hospitality. And loving strangers means this, that we have an open heart. There is, there is room in my life to be in deep, caring relationships that are not a part of my tribe. There, there is room in my life to be in deep, caring relationships with people that are not a part of my tribe, number one. But number two, I am always on the outlook for the expansion of my loving relationship empire. That that ought to flesh itself out when we walk into the gathering or we show up at life group or we find ourselves in the grocery store. Someone told me just this week that they went to a, a large, probably doctrinally correct ministerially. This church is doing so many powerful and amazing things, and I believe they are a, gr- a great powerhouse for the kingdom of God in our area. And this person told me, he said, I went there and I'll never go back because when I went there, Nobody spoke to me. What's the big deal about speaking to somebody? The big deal about speaking to somebody is to say, hey, something's going on here. There is authentic community here. There are genuinely loving people here, and we have room to love you as well. And we want you to come and be a part of our kingdom, particularly if you are a stranger. There should be this sensitivity to strangers for those of us who are going through times of shaking. And our mantra ought to be, no stranger left behind. The text tells us that we need to be doing this, and there is this possibility that you're going to entertain angels unaware. Many commentators said that this doesn't necessarily refer to the fact that you are going to encounter uh, angels when you talk to a stranger in the parking lot at Ingalls. It, it, most would say that he's referring to uh, Genesis 18 where Abraham entertained people and was hospitable to people, and in doing so, there, there were angelic divine beings there that he was entertaining. But what we can take from This would be by way of principle um, that we cannot calculate the immense value of hospitality. We cannot calculate the immense value of hospitality in, in what we give or in what we receive. Uh, hospitality can be evangelistic. There are those who are curious. And the only way that we will have that curiosity about our kingdom satisfied is if we pull back the curtain and we invite them in and let them see that this thing is real by how we welcome them, by how we love them, and by how we love each other. Hospitality can be evangelistic, and loving strangers can also be edifying. Our greatest source of spiritual Maturity is, is unofficial relationships in unnatural hospitality. Our greatest source of spiritual maturity is unofficial relationships in the midst of unnatural 
hospitality. Not when I'm getting together to say, hey, we're here from 8 to 9. Not when we've got this class that's going on or we're trying to read a book together. But when I am just naturally hospitable and welcoming people into our lives. And we're sitting around the table having conversations, sharing and doing life on life with one another. And investing ourselves and getting inside the souls of one another. And that is experienced in brotherly love and that is experienced in hospitality. So we should love the, the saints. We should love strangers. And thirdly, we should love the suffering. If you'll look at verse 3 with me, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. So there is this, um, um, this empathy that we have. Some have said that this is an imaginative Empathy. He's not talking about just a prison ministry and go see everybody in prison, although that's not a bad thing. The, uh, scripture addresses that in other places. But he's talking about believers who have experienced pers persecution and found themselves in prison. They don't have government programs to support their kids. They don't have government programs to provide housing for their wives. So what are these people going to do? I'm going to look at this brother that's been, been in prison for the sake of his faith, and I'm going to identify with him, and I'm going to identify with what he's experiencing, and I'm going to identify with his needs and I'm going to respond to them as though I would want somebody to respond to my family. And so we're loving the brothers and sisters in Christ comprehensively. We're providing care. We're providing provision. We're providing it for them personally. We're willing to go visit them in prison and give them what they need. And we're also willing to take care of their families as though they were our families. If we have entered the kingdom... We will embrace the ethics of the kingdom. If we have entered the kingdom, we will embrace the ethics of the kingdom. And the ethics of the kingdom begin with a love that is unending. We love the saints, we love strangers, and we love the suffering. But there are more eth ethics in the text. What are the ethics of the kingdom? What are the things that we need to anchor ourselves to in these shaking times? We need to anchor ourselves to an unending love. But secondly, we need to anchor ourselves to a sacred marriage. And that's point two. Marriage is sacred. If you will, look at the text. It's quite brief and extremely comprehensive. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. It couldn't be said any clearer, any more succinctly. And it's a message that our culture needs to hear uh, very desperately. Um, let me give you some context for why the writer of Hebrews is, is saying that. Um, there were those in the early church that believed that marriage was... Uh, detrimental to being as spiritual as you could possibly be. There are those that believed that singleness, that chastity, and that virginity, having never had sex, was the condition that afforded the greatest opportunity for true spirituality. Uh, there was a, 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 a group of Montanists, and the Montanists uh, created this thing um, called monastic celibacy where these people would gather in communities, and they were the truly spiritual. They were relationally, they were sexually unaffected and disconnected. And, and so uh, he's, he's saying, no, no, wait a minute, marriage is honorable and all. And so he was dealing not only with the ascetics, um, these asceticism, these people who believed that singleness and virginity were superior and that marriage was inferior and undesirable. And by the way, some people are married and believe that. And some of you are married to that person, and I would encourage you to repent. Asceticism in this fashion has no place um, in marriage. But not only were there the ascetics, but there were the libertines. They, they believed that marriage was irrelevant. Their idea was, I got into marriage, and if marriage doesn't scratch my lust itch, then I'll get out of marriage, and they made a mockery of marriage. Marriage was a joke. And that's where we live today. I don't think too many people are concerned about the ascetic portion of it, but many are libertines in the culture and even 
in the church today. So it's in that context of people saying that the people that are, that are sexually disconnected and unaffected are the more spiritual, and there are those that say marriage is irrelevant and uh, has no meaning for me. He gives these two commands. And the first command, hang on to this, marriage is honorable. Um, and let me just say, and I'm not trying to be crass, and I'm not trying to be careless, and I don't know who's watching today, but I am going to use the word S-E-X, and I've already used that, and I'm not going to use it inappropriately, and I'm not going to use it in an off-color way, but some of you may want to hit the mute button if you don't want um, some around you this morning to hear that word. I would encourage you to go back and listen to it because it's going to be used um, in, a, in, a very, in a very appropriate um, manner, but it's necessary in order to say what the text says this morning. We want to be faithful um, to the text. Marriage is honorable. Celibacy is not superior to marriage. Listen to me. Celibacy is not superior to marriage. Number two, promiscuity is not superior to marriage. Marriage is God's best. Marriage is God's gift. It's humanity's best. It doesn't get any better than marriage. You say, are you saying that marriage is better than singleness? I'm saying that marriage is honorable. And I'm not necessarily trying to compare it to someone who is called to be single, and I'm not trying to make somebody who feels called to singleness left out. I'm just trying to deal with what the text says this morning. And when we come to the text that deal with the issues of singleness, we'll proclaim that with all of the authority that the Bible has in it. But let us deal with this um, this morning. Marriage is a gift from God. Marriage is not prison. Your spouse is not a ball and chain. And I would ask you this morning, what is your attitude toward your marriage and your spouse? What is your attitude toward your marriage and your spouse? Would you like to get out of marriage? Do you feel like marriage is detrimental to you spiritually? Do you feel like marriage is detrimental to you financially? Do you wish you had married uh, somebody else instead of the woman or the man that you're married to? Can I tell you that those attitudes are dishonoring marriage? Can I tell you that those attitudes are inconsistent with the will of God for your marriage? Marriage is honorable. And the text says this, the marriage bed, and, and the words marriage bed literally is, is a, a phrase that means sexual union. The marriage bed is undefiled. Uh, we in the church need to hold marriage in high honor. It needs a high place. It needs great respect. And within the confines of marriage, he says that the, the sexual union is undefiled. Let me tell you what that means. The only place that sex is permissible is within the confines of marriage. The only place that sex is permissible is within the confines of marriage. It is not permissible prior to marriage, and it is not permissible outside of the bonds of marriage between a man and a woman. Let us make no mistake about that. Not only is that the clear teaching of Scripture, but the violation of it brings serious judgment and consequences. The only place that sex is permissible is within the confines of marriage. Let me say two things. Number one, if you are not married and you are sexually active, I would challenge you and encourage you this morning to stop and repent. Number two, if you are not married or in marriage and you have violated what God's word says, I will tell you that there is mercy and that there is grace and that Jesus has died for that sin. Number three, I would say this. If you are in that sin and you don't repent of that sin, you are bringing shame to the gospel of Jesus Christ because your marriage is a reflection of the gospel. And so if you've messed up, I want to offer you hope. I want you to find hope in Christ and Christ alone. But if you have a low view of marriage and you're being very careless and you are driven by your sex drive and by your lust and that's captured you and got a hold of you, I'm telling you that you are in trouble this morning. The only place that sex is permissible is within the confines of marriage. Secondly, sex belongs to marriage and nowhere else period. 
Thirdly, if you are not married, you should not be having sex. Fourthly, if you are married, you should be having sex, experiencing sexual intimacy. The marriage bed, listen to me, listen to me, the marriage bed should be the most sexually exciting, exhilarating, and fulfilling place in this world, and the world should not be able to offer any threats or any improvements. Let that sink in. We, we should not have to let our imagination and all of the stimuli come to our brain and our heart from the world that easily convinces us that there is more to be had outside of everything that God has given us. And quite frankly, there need to be some changes in our attitudes toward marriage, and there need to be some changes in our attitudes toward the marriage bed for those that aren't married and for those that are married and for those that are violating the clear commands of Scripture and for those that are even committed to their marriage relationship. The God of heaven has designed it so that those of us who are married will find the greater joy and the greater contentment and the greater uh, ex experience of intimacy in the marriage bed that God has given to us. What a great, great gift. And we need to proclaim that, not in an inappropriate way. Your, your children need to know in, in general that y'all have this loving relationship as mom and dad and that you are committed to each other. If you're looking for or experiencing sex outside of the marriage bed, outside of sex with your spouse, physically, listen, virtually, digitally, on a computer screen, then you are in serious trouble. Look at the text again, if you will. He says, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. I know that sounds so negative in 2020, but, but God does not take a, adultery, the, the violation of a, of, of a commitment that demands fidelity between a man and a woman. God does not take adultery and God does not take um, sex outside of marriage lightly. He says you will be judged for that. I want to tell you there's mercy I want to tell you there's grace, and I want to tell you to repent of your sin, and I want to tell you to run to that mercy and run to that grace and find your identity and who Christ says you are. But don't stay in your sin. You can't stay there. You will be judged. You will regret it. If you are defiling your marriage covenant, if you are defiling your marriage bed, if you are pursuing or experiencing sexual intimacy outside of marriage, you are in serious trouble. Fence your marriage. Put a fence around your marriage. Feed your marriage. Protect your marriage. Enjoy your marriage. These are the ethics of this unshakable kingdom. If we have entered the kingdom, we will embrace the ethics of the kingdom. Love will continue and marriage will be sacred. But thirdly, God is faithful. God is faithful. And, and the text is pointing this out. Don't go looking for something to satisfy you besides God. In, in this unshakable kingdom, we're, we're, we're not putting God on the smorgasbord. We're not putting God on the list of options. We're not trying to... This is, this is the, the um, heresy of the prosperity gospel that you can somehow have all of God and all of the world and that somehow God is all satisfying and money is all satisfying and being covetous is all satisfying and materialism is all satisfying and hyper individualization is all satisfying. Only God is all satisfying. God is faithful. Love is to continue, marriage is to be sacred, and God is faithful. Look at the text, verse 5. Keep your, your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is what we have. 
when the shaking comes and you can't get your money out of the bank or the value of the dollar plummets or the stock market dries up, what do you have? What do you have? You have a God who is faithful. The text says essentially two things. Number one, don't be covetous. Don't be greedy. Don't love money. Don't live for money. Don't long for money. F.F. Bruce said, the the chief pang which pierces the heart of the lover of money is anxiety. That's what covetousness will bring you. It will bring you anxiety. Everybody is having so much anxiety because of how the coronavirus is impacting us economically. And if we don't have money, what reason do we have for living? That's rooted in our covetousness. I've seen so many People who have nothing and love Jesus and all of a sudden they have fallen into money and it changed everything in their life for the worse because they stopped loving God and they started loving money. Those who love money will never be happy. Those who are greedy will never be happy. I want to just stop and say that having money is not bad, earning money is not bad, using money for the sake of the kingdom is not bad. We are, we are uh, so thankful for the people in our body who love the Lord and He has blessed with the ability to earn income and those people have said that I will use my resources for the sake of the kingdom and the good of the brethren and for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful for that. I'm not trying to beat you up if you have money, but just make sure for those of you that God is blessed with the ability with the proverbial green thumb as it relates to money and everything you ter- touch turns to gold, recognize that God has blessed you so that you can bless others and so that you can be a great benefit to his kingdom. But don't fall in love with money. What is the, what is the deal about money? What is the deal about money? The danger of money is not and its amount. The danger of money is not where you put the the decimal point. The danger in money is not the number of zeros. The danger in money is this. Money changes how we see ourselves. Money fundamentally changes our heart because it whispers in our ear and tells us that we are better and more powerful and more admirable and more successful. And it tells us that we can walk into a room and hold our head up because people are saying, look at him. And the only thing that has called them to look at us is the size of our bank account. And that's tragic. Money changes the way we see ourselves. Those with the greatest affection for wealth will be the least committed and the first to turn aside when the kingdom is shaken. And by the way, when the kingdom is shaken, the money is going to be shaken out with it. I promise you. It's difficult to have wealth and not trust in it. It's difficult. Jesus said that. It's difficult to have wealth and not trust in it. It's difficult to have wealth and not make it your God. It's difficult to have wealth and believe that it is the greatest means to what you want and need. I need this money. I, this money is the key to what I want. This money is the key to what, I'm, what I need. This money is the key to who I am. And he's giving us this warning against that. And he's saying, keep yourself free from the love of money and keep yourself free from the the clutches of money, the claws of money digging into you. Because when things are shaken, you won't have it to hold on to. He said, and be content. Keep yourself free from the love of money and be content with what? You have contentment is the opposite of covetousness. Contentment springs from an intelligent trust in God and his promises. Contentment springs from an intelligent trust in God and his promises. That's the only place contentment will be found. You'll never have enough money. You'll never have enough possessions. You'll never have enough material. You'll you'll never have enough power to be content. Contentment is found in Christ and Christ alone. There was this great king and he was so miserable and he was so uh, uh, discontent. And someone came to him and they said, 
says, O great king, if you would find the shirt of a man who is content, then you will find contentment. And the, the search went out all over the world to find a man who was content so the king could have his shirt. Unfortunately for the king, when they found the content man, he had no shirt. Contentment doesn't come from having anything. Contentment comes from a source other than things or possessions. And we keep looking for that shirt, thinking we'll have contentment, and it never comes to our soul. Let me just say a couple of things about contentment, and this is what I believe the text is bearing out. Don't ever look to or live for something that isn't Christ and expect it to give you what only Christ can give. Don't don't ever look to and live for something that isn't Christ and expect it to give you what only Christ can give. True contentment, deep internal peace is found in Christ and Christ alone. And the text tells us it's not in money, it's in contentment. And contentment comes when we hear him say to us, I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. I'm reminded of the song, How Firm a Foundation. Listen to this. It says, How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith and his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus has fled. And the last verse says this, The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That so, that soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. When the shaking comes, there is only one place to run. And that is to our faithful God. If you have entered the kingdom, you will embrace the ethics of the kingdom. The ethics of the kingdom are these. Love is unending. Secondly, marriage is sacred. And third, God is faithful. These are the ethics of the kingdom. But let me take it a step further this morning. These virtues are not just rules for those who who say they are Christians um, to follow. These virtues are not just rules for those who say they are Christians to follow. These virtues are insights into the heart of the king who is over the kingdom. These virtues are insights into the heart of the king who is over the unshakable kingdom. This is such a beautiful picture that we see in the text this morning because we see Christ. The the king in this kingdom is loving. He he welcomes us into his family. And there is no one in the kingdom who has trusted Christ who is unwelcomed. There is no one in the kingdom who has trusted Christ who is a stranger. There, There is no one in the kingdom who is struggling who it will be marginalized or ostracized or rejected. When we're in the kingdom and we're with the king, the heart of the king says, you're all my family. So so the the king is loving and the kingdom is a loving kingdom. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Not only is the king loving, but secondly, the king is faithful. Uh, The king is faithful like a a faithful husband to uh, a a faithful wife. We can go to Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as 
Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. This is our faithful king who gave himself for us. He died for our sin in our place. He paid our sin debt. He satisfied the righteous requirements of a holy God when he died. And God was satisfied with his death for you and for me. And he rose victorious and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he is representing us as sinful creatures before a holy God and proclaiming our purity and our holiness before God because of the sufficiency of his work on our behalf. What kind of love is that? Our great king is a faithful king who is loyal and loving and redemptive and intimate and a joy to be around and will protect those who are his like a faithful husband who would never glance away or be unfaithful or lie or deceive his spouse. This king is faithful. He's not, he's not out there to use you, to get something from you for the sake of himself. The king, the king is loving. The king is faithful. Thirdly, the text bears this out. The king is generous. This king, this king sees you out there groping for money and for materialism and he knows that you're eaten up on the inside and that you're empty and that you're, you're hollowed out and that you're bitter because your covetousness has never been satisfied and you've used people and you've stepped on people and you've used money and you've cheated and he's right here. I have all that you need. That's why he's saying, that's why he has said to us in the text, let your life be free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. What do I have? I will never leave you nor forsake you. This, this king is generous. He gives us everything we need. And we don't, we don't need what this world's kingdom has to offer. And he's trying to protect us from that. He's given us himself. He is all that we need. And then, and then fourthly, the king is loving, the king is faithful, the king is generous, and the king is always with his people. This king is not looking for some castle to go hide out in. He's not looking for some high throne to sit on that nobody can access. This king, this king is with his people. This king never says, hey, time out, guys. I need some me time. This king never says, oh, you people are just exhausting me. I've got to get away from you. You don't know how much pressure all of you people are on me. No, this king legitimately in his heart wants to be with his people. Jesus left heaven and came to earth to live among men to reveal the Father to us. And he laid down his life and died and paid for our men for our sins so he could take us as sinful human beings to the Father so that we could spend all eternity with him in his unshakable kingdom. This is the heart. This is the heart of the king. The king is loving. The king is faithful. The king is generous. The king is always with his people. Folks, this is a great kingdom. And, and I want to say two things as I close. First of all, when we embrace the virtues of the kingdom, we become an explanation of and an invitation to the kingdom. When we embrace these virtues of brotherly love continuing, of marriage being sacred, of our God being faithful and better than any money or material that this world can provide, when we embrace these virtues, our lives become an explanation of the kingdom and an invitation to the kingdom. And so my invitation to you this morning is this. First of all, if you say you're a believer, I, I want you to grab a hold. Shaking is here. It's now. And it's coming. And it's going to get worse. You better make sure you're in Christ's kingdom. And you better hold on to the virtues of the kingdom. But if you're not in Christ's kingdom, I want to invite you to come into the kingdom. Our, our king is a, a loving king. Our king is a faithful king. Our king is a generous king. Our king wants to be with his people. This kingdom is real. You can see it in our lives. You can see it in our church. Would you repent of your sin this morning? Would, would you tell Christ that you are trusting him 
that you believe that he is the son of God, that he died for your sin in your place? Will you accept his payment for your sin? And will you trust the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to make you right with the holy God? If you'll do that, he'll change you from the inside out and you'll be part of an unshakable kingdom that will be standing when everything else crumbles. Would you come into this kingdom with me this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that you would apply it to our hearts, and I pray that you would be glorified. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to realize that there is a kingdom of this world. It could not be clearer than it is in the day and age in which we live and cause us to realize that there is a great king and his kingdom is an unshakable kingdom. And Lord, I pray that we would invite as many as we can to come and be a part of this kingdom with this king and with us as his people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. I know that these are uh, challenging and trying times. Um, I know that you miss gathering with us here, and I certainly love and miss y'all and look forward to the time when we can gather back together in as normal, uh, as normal circumstances as they could possibly um, be. Continue to pray for us. Uh, continue to keep in touch with us through social media and continue to join with us here in this format as long as we possibly can. Um, and let us continue to pray for and love one another during this season. Let's read this benediction together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead.